since there's so much jealousy in this room tonight that I can feel over this. A few weeks later, I bought another. are vital tools. Look at Kenneth Copeland, who along with his wife Gloria are among the most successful TV evangelists. A few years back, he asked his followers to help buy a $20 million jet, promising it would only be used for church business. But a local news crew did some digging, and what they found will probably not surprise you. It was a News 8 investigation last February which first raised questions about Copeland's apparently personal use of his new church jet. This is a preaching machine most notably for a ski trip to colorado and visits to an exotic game ranch in south texas here's copeland and his son john proudly posing with a pair of axis deer indigenous to india and sri lanka holy shit this guy's like a psychotic reverse noah two by two male and female came to kenneth copeland and he doth shot them right between the fucking eyes now, Copeland's ministry will tell you that he reimburses the church for trips like that, but that still means he has private jet reimbursement money. And yet, despite that personal wealth, people still send Kenny Copeland, Creflo Dollar, and that arsehole with two planes. Lots and lots of money. And that's partly because they preach something called the prosperity gospel, which argues that wealth is a sign of God's favor, and donations will result in wealth coming back to you. But that idea sometimes takes the form of seed faith, the notion that donations are seeds that you will one day get to harvest. Uh, let me show you that in action. The size of your seed will determine the size of your harvest. I don't understand why, but there's something happens at a level where people step into faith and give a thousand dollars that don't happen at other levels. You're going to have a breakthrough through this 200 and $73 seed. All you've got is a thousand dollars. Listen, that's not enough money anyway to buy the house. You're trying to get in the apartment. You're trying to buy the house. That's not enough money anyway. You get to that phone and you put that seed in the ground and watch God work it out. The, the, the argument is, sow your money in the ground and you will reap returns multiple times over. Except, as an investment, you'd be better off burying your money in the actual ground. Because at least that way, there is a chance your dog may dig it up and give it back to you one day. Good boy. But, but it can get even more predatory. Because if, say, you don't have a thousand dollars, or perhaps have significant credit card debts, seed faith can still work for you. I have a feeling that somebody that wants a credit card debt wiped out, that if you use your faith as you sow, as you sow the thousand on a credit card, as you use your faith, as you use your faith, God's going to wipe out your credit card indebtedness. Think about that. That is the equivalent of saying the key to you losing weight lies at the bottom of this giant Costco bulk bag of peanut butter M&Ms. Go find it. It's definitely down there. And all of this, all of this would be amusing if... The targets of these messages were not often vulnerable people like Bonnie Parker. She did not seek medical treatment for cancer, instead choosing to sow money into Kenneth Copeland's church. And I'll let her daughter pick it up from there. I started finding notebooks. I don't know if she passed away, but she believed, and I know she believed, because it's in the notebooks, that if she sowed enough seed, which was money, um, the, the greater amount of seed that you sow, according to them, um, the better chance you have, the better chance you have of getting healed. At this point, I think it's clear that seed faith is the most disgusting seed-based concept since whatever the fuck chia seed pudding is. <laughs> Bonnie Parker gave thousands of dollars to the Copeland's church because she believed it was her best chance of beating cancer. And you might think, well, that's crazy. But it's not an unreasonable interpretation of the Copeland's preachings. Gloria Copeland sells numerous products on healing through faith and has been skeptical in the past about going to the doctor. We know what's wrong with you. You've got cancer. The bad news is we don't know what to do about it, except give you some poison that'll make you sicker. Now, 
Which do you want to do? Do you want to do that? Or do you want to sit here on Saturday morning, hear the word of God, and let faith come into your heart and be healed? It's pretty clear that woman cannot hear the word of God, because if she could, I'm pretty sure he'd be shouting, Fuck you, Gloria! Right to her ear! And yet, and yet, not only is everything you've seen so far legal, but the money people donate in response to it is tax-free. Because if you're registered as a religious non-profit, or especially a church, you are given broad exemptions over taxation and regulation. Uh, the IRS, in fact, produced a scintillating video instructing its agents how to treat churches, and it contains a phrase that you would not normally associate with the agency. Hello, and welcome to churches and religious organizations, do's and don'ts. For reasons as old as the United States, the tax laws and regulations that govern churches and religious organizations are purposely broad and sometimes a little vague. A little vague? Oh, they are underselling that because the films of Christopher Nolan are a little vague. A text from your mom reading, please call not emergency, but please call very important, don't worry. That's a little vague. The IRS regulations are close to meaningless. According to their tax codes, not only is the term church not specifically defined, they make no attempt to evaluate whether the content of a doctrine is religious, provided the beliefs are truly held and are not illegal. But truly held beliefs that are not illegal is almost every belief. Bros before hoes? That could be a religion. Red vines are better than Twizzlers? That could be a religion. If you believe the best movie ever made is Lady in the Water, then your name is M. Night Shyamalan, but congratulations, Mr. Shyamalan, that belief could be a religion. And being designated a church confers all sorts of benefits, like the parsonage allowance, which allows the Copelands to live in a $6.3 million house tax-exempt. This is their house. That is a parsonage which only makes sense if by parsonage they mean house that looks like it cost the net worth of Big Bang Theory's Jim Parsons. We actually asked the IRS how many churches they've audited in recent years, and they did one in 2014 and just two in 2013. The odds of a church getting audited are basically the same as Gloria Copeland curing your fucking cancer. And, and when you can operate, here's the thing, when you can operate so little oversight. It is amazing what you are able to do. Look at Robert Till. If you ever send him a donation, you cannot imagine what happens. And luckily, you don't have to imagine because, and we should probably come clean here, we have been involved in a correspondence with Robert Till's church for the last seven months to try and find out what he tells people. So settle in because this gets incredible. Back in January, I sent him $20 and a letter asking to be added to his mailing list. Within two weeks, he sent me a letter back thanking me for my donation and claiming, I believe that God has supernaturally brought us together. And supernatural is a bit of a stretch. I saw him on television and I sent him some money. He wasn't my dead lover who came back to help me with some pottery. But soon afterwards, he sent me a second letter and inside there was a $1 bill, which was exciting until I saw the inscription instructing me to send it back to him with your best Prove God tithes or offering. That's right, I had to send the $1 back with an additional recommended offering of $37, which I did. So at this point, we're just two letters in, and already it's like having a pen pal who's in deep with some loan sharks. This correspondence continued back and forth like this until March, when he sent me three small packets of coloured oil that I was instructed to pour on letters and send back to him by specific dates, along with more money. So I did that, and in April, I got a letter in a manila envelope with the message, check enclosed, and I thought, fantastic, I've seeded, and I've seeded, and I've seeded, here comes my harvest. Then I open it, and this is true, it was a check for five dollars from me, made out to Pastor Tilton's church. This went on for seven more letters. And then he sent me a piece of fabric in the shape of some mountains. I assumed at this point I'd somehow reached the mountain level. And surprise, surprise, he asked me to send those mountains back to him 
with some more money again, so I did, and then he sent me another letter with another single dollar bill inside. He told me to put that dollar bill in my Bible for one night and then send it back the next day with 49 more dollars so that he can have it blessed with oil and send me a one dollar bill back that has been blessed, adding, I must warn you not to rob God with your tithes and offerings. And then for emphasis, I can't urge you enough, do not let this one dollar bill stay in your house. And you know what? I kept that one dollar bill because fuck him. I received another oil package, more prayer cloths, and even, and this is true, an outline of his foot, which I was asked to trace my foot on and mail back to him with more money. So, as of tonight, I have sent him $319 and received 26 letters. That's almost one a week. And again, this is all hilarious until you imagine these letters being sent to someone who cannot afford what he's asking for. So at this point, I was getting pretty angry and looking for a sign of what to do. So I watched a little more Robert Tilton, and the most amazing thing happened. There's a person watching me, and you've been very frustrated with your purpose in life. That might be me, Bob, because I'm extremely frustrated right now, as it seems my purpose in the last seven months has been to send you money through the fucking mail. So... I, I, I will ask, what's that message you have for me? That's so strong just then. Just then, I had a word of knowledge for someone that's really been seeking God, you have, for a particular purpose or a decision in your life. And that is when I realized the message Robert Tilt was sending me was that I should set up my own church to test the legal and financial limits of what religious entities can be able to do. So, that is what we have done. We filed paperwork last week establishing a church called Our Lady of Perpetual Exemption. And it was disturbingly easy. To make sure we did this correctly, we had this actual tax lawyer walk us through the process. Now, while the IRS does not have a definition of a church, they do have a 14-point test as a guideline for churches. But not only do you not have to meet all 14 points, we'd already met some of them by accident. For instance, you need an established place of worship, but we meet every Sunday in this studio in New York. Our church needed to be a distinct legal entity, so we, we registered our church as a non-profit corporation in Texas, a state I do not live in, have never lived in, or which is somehow completely fine for us to incorporate a church in. Now, the IRS's guidelines suggest you need a, a creed and form of worship, but our lawyer suggested we could fulfill the worship requirements by merely leading everyone in some specific ritual, such as having congregants firmly meditate on the nature of fraudulent churches. So, let us do exactly that and bow our heads in silent contemplation. And lo, another box was ticked. Amen. Our attorney, the best case for church membership will be made by those individuals who are actually present in the live studio audience who will profess belief in the church's creed. So what do you say, live studio audience? Do you profess your belief? Do you profess your belief to the There is only one thing left for us to do. Let's go to church. Sisters, welcome to Our Lady of Perpetual Exemption. I am your mega reverend, thank you, brothers and sisters, your mega reverend and CEO, John Oliver. And can I tell you, I am so blessed tonight, so blessed to be joined by my radiant wife, Wanda Jo Oliver. Please welcome her. Please welcome her. Wanda Jo. Wanda Jo, to all of you watching us tonight or joining us online at www.ourladyofperpetualexemption.com. 
and most of all, praise be to the IRS, oh. that most permissive of government agencies. Wonder Joe, I have heard the word of prophecy. Hallelujah! What did it say, Major? I'll tell you. I'll tell you, Mawanda. It says the viewers at home must plant a seed. A seed! Mm. An almighty seed! Yes. Preferably in the form of cash, although we do take checks. It, it can be $5, it can be $10, it can be $77. We need you to sow your biggest seed. That's, that's money. Don't send us seed. That's right, Wanda. Please do not send us actual seed. Because we ain't interested in hating your seed. We ain't interested. We ain't interested. Please send us your actual money to this address at the bottom of your screen. If you do this, and this is real, great things will happen to you, and that's apparently something I'm allowed to say. Praise! Praise legal! Praise our tax attorney! Praise loopholes and all their blessings of let, let me talk to the brothers and sisters at home. Do you have debt? Debt be gone! Do you have lupus? A demon thing! Touch, touch your hand to the screen right now, and we shall cure it. Touch your hand to the screen right now. Curse you! Curse you, demon lupus! Be devil us no more! Curse you, lupus! You, you probably didn't even know that you had lupus, but you did it! actual number right now 1-800 because amazingly all of this is this is all legal call this toll-free number and plant your seat plant it deep in him okay plant your seed in his mouth plant it all over his face yeah, wonder, wonder, you, you keep it together wonder keep it together praise 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 seed. call this number sow your seed and ye shall prosper what wonder wonder do you feel the spirit Come on, dude, get it!
motherfucker, dude. God, dude. Dude. Oh my god, dude. care so much what people think about me. I think I'm gay. So this is Vulture Mine. Yeah. The shafts don't exist anymore because they're either collapsed or condemned. You don't want a rock to fall on your head, but as you can see, the yep. bones of the ghost town that surrounded the mine and were funded by it. Remain. You've really, uh, really undone yourself this season. Yeah, I just kind of looked into places that would make me want to die, and I think this checks that box. Yeah, it's very imposing. I think it can help. Gross. Come on. Okay. BuzzFeed Unsolved, we investigate Vulture Mine and its surrounding ghost town in Wickenburg, Arizona, as part of our ongoing investigation into the question, are ghosts real? Shane, you always told me that in a fantasy world, where ghosts exist, your words not mine, fantasy, yes. that, that the only place that would be haunted is a mine. So, yeah. It seems like a lot of misery, a lot of suffering, and people get trapped in them. So, if ghosts were real, I would put my money on mine. Hmm. Okay, well, I mean, maybe tonight you'll get lucky then. Season premiere, we're gonna look around this Jesus. Is it disgusting? Did I just blind you? Oh, man. Yeah, good, good. It'll give you the vision. <laughs> There's gonna be a car back there. We got some bushes. Uh, I can't believe a better way to kick off the season, right? Great. <laughs> just don't shine your light in my face. Okay, with it? Stop me. <laughs> 
Walt was one of the worst thieves the Mayan ever saw. Waltz also claimed to have a secret mine in the Superstition Mountains where he would return with enormous quantities of gold. To this day, nobody has found the location of Waltz's mine, now referred to as the Dutchman's Lost Mine. Though, some believe the Lost Mine doesn't exist, and that the gold Waltz claimed to find there was merely gold that he stole from Bolger. Yeah, it was 100%. <laughs> <laughs> he was just showing up with pockets full of gold, and people were like, uh... Where'd you get Where that, Jacob? I found it out in the hills. It's from my secret mine. Only I know where it is. Don't check my word. It only appeals to me at midnight. <laughs> Unfortunately, due to deterioration, the actual mining tunnels are no longer safe for entry. But there is one place open for visitors that serves as a massive tombstone to former webs of mining tunnels. This spiritually active area is unfortunately referred to as the glory hole. I thought glory hole used to mean something very innocuous, though. It was innocuous back then. Uh-huh. But this is not what it It got that name because penis is... <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, where the man fucked the earth, <laughs> hoping to impregnate it with gold. The glory hole is a reported site of great tragedy. <laughs> Tell me, tell me all about the tragedy, right? <laughs> in 1923, this cavern collapsed after one of the stone support pillars was overmined for the valuable ores inside of it. <laughs> they were mining the support beams? <laughs> Carl, I don't think you should do that. That's a God, uh, there's gold in here. I know it. Mind your own business. I'm going to strike it big. <laughs> killed seven miners and 12 burrows, leaving their bodies trapped and undiscovered in the rubble. Former caretaker Marty Hagen believes the collapse occurred because the seven ill-fated miners were stealing, thus chipping away extra without regulation. He believes part of the reason their bodies remained is due to the fact that they were thieves and a proper burial was in high priority. Just imagine all that we're standing in was just miles of elaborate, complex, intertwining tunnels. 13 miles? 13 miles. And now just all in one fatal swoop gone, burying people down below. It's crazy. That being said, <laughs> a bug flew up my nose. Yeah, I think I've swallowed about six tablespoons of bugs at this point. Just anybody who wants to let their presence be known, say something, move something, maybe even throw something. Rock or slide would be very efficient. God, I feel like I can't believe I'm provoking these people. Silent. Aside from the bugs in my ears, yes. Is it true that you stole gold and you were down here when you weren't supposed to be? You took a little bit more than you should have, and that's why you got crushed to death? Oh, geez, that was my bat flew right behind you. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> that bat was straight up going for your ass. <laughs> it was an ass bat. <laughs> Alright, well, I think we're gonna leave. Maybe I'll hear you later when I analyze this audio. Or. According to Shane, it'll just be uh, rocks rustling or a rubber shoe pivoting, something stupid like that. You, you honestly think we'll get audio of rocks rustling around here? <laughs> what is... uh... Another paranormal hotspot is the two-story assay building, once used to produce bars of semi-pure gold and silver. Back in the day, this building contained a vault where these bars and precious metals were kept safe. It's said that the whole city in general was lawless and ran rampant with crime. I love it. Especially, crime's even better when it just involves bars of gold. So also, one interesting fact about the city that I haven't included is it was ran mostly by vigilante justice. Oh! So there was just, people were running amok, stabbing people in the neck. This is yeah. great. I'm a big fan of the West, you know? Yeah, Cowboys, yeah. Westerns. I like Deadwood on HBO. There was a lot going on. There's action, dancing, gold, Dan smooching. Dancing. Dancing, gold, smooching, action. That's all they did back in the day. Lord. Yeah, that sounds like your kind of town, except for the action part. Uh, yeah, I'm more of a... I'm you're more of a rocking guy. You're more of a dancing and smooching kind of guy. Bring me some gold. Bring and me then, some smooches. And then running away from the action. No action? <laughs> <laughs> Even so, the assay building, due to the valuables that it was protecting, was reportedly under constant attack by avaricious bandits hoping to procure the gold inside. 
While we have no documentation confirming these attacks, one could assume that such a violent area may have resulted in some deaths, perhaps explaining the negative feel reported by visitors to the assay building. People have reported rocks being thrown and dust falling from the ceiling as if someone is above. One investigator captured an EVP of someone saying, get out. Oh, there's a rat. There's a big ass rat. Where'd he go? He's behind the tarp. Okay, that just like a rat. This is pretty intense. This looks like some kind of kiln of some sort, I'm not sure, but a furnace maybe. Yeah. At this moment, our audio recorder picks up what sounds like a loud whisper. <laughs> now what do you think that is? Well, I think it's a whisper, but that's also because, if you notice, it's going over my voice. <laughs> it sure is. I think it's fair to say it's not either of our voices. But here's the thing, there's so many different noises going on at once here. And then, with what, there's a ghost whisper somewhere in this little moment? Yeah, and what does it say? It just goes... I think it's a message from the great beyond. Well, okay. God said, go back to Earth. You're not done yet. I want you to tell them something. Oh, what do you want me to tell them? There are countless worlds out there to be explored. So much to learn. learn, learn. That's what we do. I'm going to figure this thing out. Whatever it takes. Well, that's why we're here. Troublesome landmark at Vulture Mine is the hanging tree. 
that still stands on the property. I just like that they found one good tree and they were like, that's the one. This one's sturdy. We're going to use that over and over. It's not doing anything else besides casting shade. Not throwing shade, but casting shade. Do you, do you think people felt bad catching shade from that tree on a sunny oh, day? I can't imagine they picnicked under the hanging tree, especially because a lot of times they just left the body hanging there. What? Anyways, moving on. In fact, some believe that Henry Wickenburg, who at the end of his life declined in both health and wealth, committed suicide by gunshot near this tree. Either way, the remains of Wickenburg's personal cabin still sit by this tree. But as the name would suggest, this tree held a much more ominous purpose. According to legend, as many as 18 miners were hung from this very tree between the 1860s to about 1900, the crime being stealing. It's said that hangings at this time were particularly brutal due to the fact that the condemned person was set on a rock, which was then kicked out from under him. Using this method, the amount of time it would take to die slash suffocate could take between two minutes and two hours. Oh, no neck snapping, huh? No. They would just sit there on their tippy toes, and eventually they would get tired, and they That's would just slowly suffocate. Yeah, I know. You just want to just be a gentleman. If you're going to hang someone, be a gentleman oh, about well, it. also don't steal. You, you want to dance with the devil, you got to live with him when he sets you on fire. Okay. You can get embroidered that on a pillow or something? <laughs> no. It's a very, uh, it's like old ax maxim. It's, I don't think that's actually, I just made that up. Oh, very good. Okay, okay, very good. Great. Even more horrifying, they apparently wouldn't bury the bodies in a cemetery, but instead, on site. Some believe there are bodies littered around the area. I mean, this is a hell of a tree. I mean, it definitely has character. It looks like a Tim Burton tree. This looks like one of those Wizard of Oz trees that comes to life and fucks you up. By the way, this time they... <laughs> <laughs> Is that a bat or was that a bird? We're in bad country, buddy. I don't want the flying towards my face all the time, Jesus. This is a uh, Wickenburg's house right here. The man himself, the guy who pretty much died in the streets. <laughs> Why don't we just reach out right here, in between the hanging tree and Wickenburg's house. Kill two birds with one so stone. He, I do like that his home was right by the tree. He was like, well, we'll, we'll hang these men right outside my bedroom window. <laughs> he probably likes sipping on a little cup of tea, watching them kick to their death. And that's what you get to live from our minds. Jesus. Maybe the guy did deserve to die in the streets. Yeah. Alright, if there's anybody here right now, whether it be Henry or any of the 18 anonymous who hanged from this tree. Oh, I got a sudden hint of bravery right now. Use it. Please take advantage of this yeah, moment. I'm feeling brave right now. Put him in his place. Yeah. Show yourself. If there was actually 18 people who met their death at this spot, show yourself. Oh, that's just the that's just the camera hitting the branches. I immediately lost all the courage I had as soon as I heard a noise. <laughs> he thinks you're cowards. I don't. Okay, I, don't, I retract that. I was Thieves. I was in a moment of I, I think I'm a little it's a little Scoundrels. hot here. I got a little bit heat stroke. Arguably the most active area on the property is the old schoolhouse used to educate the children of the miners. People have reported seeing a dark figure and hearing children's laughter. In one instance, an investigator was physically attacked by being pushed. Rumor has it that near the schoolhouse, there is a mass grave of children who died of the plague, beating the spirit of the house. So what's the factual basis behind the plague? What plague? I don't know. <laughs> There's no records, all right? You know, sometimes what plague. What, a teacher just like opened up her mouth and flies came out? <laughs> I don't know. It says rumor has it. There's a mass A lot of rumors in this one, huh? They're trying to figure out why this house is so active. Well, it's cool, cool. Yeah. And uh, rumor is there's a mass grave, and that's all I could offer. So when you read something like that, are you going to be scared tonight to go over there? Yeah, I'm going to be scared. I'm scared sitting here. I got scared by rain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you did. This is the main room. I'm guessing this is where the kids were taught. There's a chalkboard. They will come for you. I heart ghost kids. I heart ghost kids. Now, once again, people hear laughter in here. Some people have even said they think they heard the piano play. God, I hate this whole building. Oh, this room. Oh, boy. Not bad. This is a nightmare. Oh, it says help on the wall. Oh my god. What? It's a fucking dead bird. What? Oh, that's an element or something. 
why is there a dead bird in here? There's probably a live bird in here. Something happened to me is dead. Oh, great analysis, Doc. Oh, Jesus, it's so rotten. His eyes are gone. It's horrifying. Ooh, its eyes aren't going to stick around. Why wasn't it Fucking asshole. Don't, don't even check. I'll check. What if I open this and a thousand rattlesnakes jump out? Then I'm going to run. All right. Let's go, boys. It's a mattress. Enter. As she looks inside the door, our audio recorder picks up what sounds like a whisper from a small child. Enter. Again, God, I'm you fucking dick. I'm not, I don't listen to these and outright think I'm gonna deny all of these just because I have to prove a point. Well, you just don't find it very compelling. Will you at least admit that it's more compelling than the other one? Yeah, it sounds like something being scraped. It sounds like a Are scrape. you kidding? This one sounds like a kid. That sounds like a kid. To me, it sounds like an evil little kid. On the first day of kindergarten, the teacher goes, and what's your name? And the kid says, <laughs> What's in this one? <laughs> this is fun, because now you have to open this door, because I open that one. What if you pick the wrong one, and there's like a, a clown with a decaying face in there? <laughs> what if you pick the wrong one, and there's a fucking clown with a decaying face in there? Open the door. Stop joking. What if, okay, I'm running, just letting you know. Yes. Uh -huh. Just the closet, just the closet, just the closet, just the Don't step on the bird. All right, we're gonna kill our lights, and when we do, hey, by the way, this is proof. You're killing your light without even whining about it or being afraid. I, I want to find some proof. Okay, cool. Please communicate with us. Here we go. Oh my god. Um, make a noise, move something, I guess touch us if you want. Touch us. Shut up, Shane. Mm. I, I think that door's opening. I didn't want to say anything, but it's, oh, it is. it's moving. <laughs> Dude, come on! Say it's the wind. If that is you opening the door, please swing it open. Oh god. It is certainly opening. Oh my god. I can't get the chills. <laughs> oh, oh my god. I'm, I'm freaking out, man. I'm freaking out. Charlotte, put your hands on my shoulder. I'll keep my back to you. I don't even need to see you. Open that door wider and wider. Oh my god. Yes. Ah, no. I, 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 I goosed all the hair in my body standing up right now. Come on, children, push that door open. Okay, we're leaving now. I'm gonna turn my light back on. Ah. Jesus Christ. I don't know if it was actually opening or if it was. Just... Oh, it was opening. Oh, no, was it? My heart's beating so fast. Let me get the fuck out of here. Alright. To finish this out, let's visit one of the entertainment venues. Much like a miner after a long day. One of these menus was a bordello that still stands today. It is here that the spirit of a woman named Mexican Rita is said to exist. Alright, this is the bordello. Come on! Bordellos went to get their uh, carrot waxed, so to speak. But that is not a euphemism. Oh, it is. They, their carrot was shiny. Let's <laughs> play a game of bearing the corn cob. <laughs> Now you see it. Fucking idiot, man. I don't like it in here. No? Jokes aside, I, I kind of hate it in here. Ooh, boy. Oh, oh, fucking God damn it. More bats. Jesus Christ. What the bats in this place? Fuck it. All right, ready? I'm going to be silent. At this moment, our audio recorder picks up a voice possibly saying what? Fuck. Fuck. Again, it doesn't sound like a voice. That clear. Okay, what did you think it saw? What it sounded like us moving around. You, okay. You, we were, listen we were to it again. Crouched on the ground, moving around. Yeah. Listen to the. Listen to what word you think this is saying. I think it's pretty clear what it's saying. I guess I could hear it all. What? Thank you. Thank you. That clearly sounds like what to me. That would also be twenty other things. No. Okay, at least say this. It's more compelling than the other two. It's the best we've gotten so far. But it also sound... Yeah, probably. It's pretty good, right? Anything else you have is shit. <laughs> shit. Rita. Rita, 
Tino or maybe one of the gents. Henry, if you used to frequent the sport demo, or is anybody in here with us? What's your name? What, what did you stop in for? Do we know what they stopped in for? They well, came in here to specifics. You mean they came in here to get their pickle polished? It's pretty obvious. I know. <laughs> oh, the bat's back. Maybe let's move to the other room. Oh, there's two rooms. Oh, this must. Okay, so these must be. Oh, so there's more bats. Oh wait, there's two bats. Oh, there's three. Oh my god. There's a bat. Oh, there's so many bats. Oh. Oh, 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 there's too many bats. If I let the Yelp review of this place, it would say far too many bats. Far too many bats. We get it with the bats. Yeah, twenty too many. One bat's fine. That's kind of cute. But at this point, who are you trying to impress? With but a band of bats, come on, man. It's a goddamn party city. Nobody needs that many bats. No one can say for certain if the former residents of Bolter Mine haunt this historic site. It was a place of great prosperity, but also violence and tragedy, making it reasonable to expect spiritual artifacts. But whether or not Bolter Mine is definitively haunted will remain unsolved. Oh my god, you fucking idiot. situation no. oh yeah yeah travis is the guy who dies first in a scary movie yeah because in that situation i probably would walk toward it and then that'd be the end of me what would your thought be as you walk towards this extremely bright light through the trees like get a load of this shit that's the last thought you'd have in your head i'd probably be curious i'd walk toward it what would make you curious enough to walk towards it what because uh, like you have a scientific mind you see this bright light coming through the trees what do you think it is at first glance aurora borealis or something you would be the best person to get him done. Oh, absolutely. The, the aliens would get tired of me. They'd kick me off. You'd be like, oh, good costumes. Yeah. Travis remembers, quote, All I felt was the numbing force of a blow that felt like a high-voltage electrocution. My mind sank quickly into unfeeling blackness, end quote. Having witnessed this, Travis's wow. friends fled the scene. Assuming Travis to be dead. Are these like early lumberjacks? What are they afraid of? I, I mean, I would be afraid of a giant spinning disc that shocked my friend. That sounds like kind of a funny image when you think of it, though. Fuck, man. Just scared lumberjacks. No, you're like your big burly friend being like, No, check it out! And then just... <laughs> <laughs> and then everybody just running. His eyeballs pop back. Yeah, just yeah. smoking. In their retreat, one of the men observed the saucer fly up to the top of the trees and away to the northeast. Some of the men returned to the scene out of guilt, only to find that Travis was no longer there. So they went back for him. Mm -hmm. It took them a day to come to their senses, but if you see some crazy shit, uh, your, your impulse is to run, at least a normal person's impulse is to run. Just bring a gun. Sure, okay, let's okay, let's pretend they had guns. Yeah. There's a giant hovering disc that's spinning at top speed shoot and shot a with your fucking gun. and shot a bolt of lightning through a man's chest and your solution is to shoot at it with a pistol? Better than better than stand there and let it shock you and poop your pants. How about run? What they did? Huh? This no. is why you would die first in a movie. So basically what we just went over 
was the experience as witnessed by all these men. Uh. Now, let's board the train to Crazy Town and go into Travis's recollection of what happened when he woke up. And this is only his recollection. Before we get into this, is there anything we need to know about Travis? No. Okay, normal dude. Normal dude. According to Travis's own writing about the experience, Travis awoke in what appeared to be a medical office or lab with a triangular ceiling among three humanoid beings with large brown eyes and abnormally large heads. They stood under five feet tall and were wearing soft, billowy orange brown overalls. What? <laughs> They're like minions? <laughs> yeah, I think like minions. No, I'm just gonna imagine this guy being operated on by minions. <laughs> Travis attacked the three beings who then retreated. As Travis explored other rooms in an attempt to escape, he encountered a large, muscular man wearing a helmet who forced him out of the craft into a warehouse with other saucers, eventually leading him into another room with three more people, all very good-looking. Quote, two men and a woman were standing around the table. They were all wearing velvety blue uniforms like the first man's, except that they had no helmets. The two men had the same muscularity and the same masculine good looks as the first man. The woman also had a face and figure that was the epitome of her gender. They were smooth-skinned and blemishless. No moles, freckles, wrinkles, or scars marked their skin. This guy sounds a little bit creepy right now. Because you'd think if you were on a spaceship, it, internalizing a lot of information right now, you know, you're surrounded by aliens, suddenly you see other people and you're not like, you don't go up to them and say, hey, what the fuck is going on? Instead, you're looking at them going, no blemishes. <laughs> no, I'm just <laughs> smooth, like porcelain. I'm a Maddie epitome of her gender. God I'm damn a it, dude. That's creepy. The striking good looks of the man I had first met became more obvious on seeing them all together. They shared a family-like resemblance, although they were not identical. End quote. These people gently pushed him onto a table and put a mask over his mouth and nose, at which point Travis passed out. The next thing Travis knew, he was lying on the ground in Heber, Arizona. He saw a silvery disc-shaped craft hovering above the road near him, which then flew straight up into the sky and disappeared silently. Although he only believed he was gone for an hour or an hour and a half, he later learned he had been missing for five days. Over this period of five days, the rest of Travis's crew came under investigation for Travis's disappearance. During this investigation, the suspects underwent psychiatric testing and polygraphs, during which none of the men confessed to faking the abduction. All of the later lie detector tests administered to Travis and the other witnesses came back as passing or inconclusive. A psychiatrist suspected that the entire abduction was in Travis's imagination, but could not explain why the others went along with it. In a recent HuffPost Weird News podcast, Travis said, quote, about 15 years later, it was discovered that the trees nearest to where the UFO hovered had been producing wood fiber at 36 times the rate it had been in the 85 years before that. A complete core sampling revealed that this thickened growth was only on the side of the trees towards or in the direction that the craft had been, end quote. As if this case couldn't get any more bizarre, Travis appeared on Fox's Moment of Truth game show, where a polygraph was conducted on stage. This particular polygraph determined that he was not telling the truth about his abduction. Regardless, Travis maintains that the events transpired as he has told them. His polygraph and all the witnesses' polygraphs that were taken earlier in an official place were all uh, passing or inconclusive. So that's what matters to me. I think this game show thing doesn't really prove shit. Is he still alive? He's still alive. Can't we just... Wow. Anytime anyone has inconclusive evidence about a polygraph like that, just bring it back in. How hard is that? I suppose. Where you at, Travis? <laughs> Where you at? You want him to tell you about the orange billowy you I want to hear about it. I want to ask him why he was so obsessed with their skin. What was the fabric like? Was it denim? It was a fine lame. <laughs> the second case is the abduction of Linda Napolitano. UFOologist Bud Hopkins worked closely with Linda to document and publicize her case. On November 30th, 1989, around 3.15 a.m. in New York City, Linda Napolitano claimed she awoke to find short aliens around her bed. She found herself unable to wake up her husband as she perceived the beings to be telling her to be quiet in an odd language. The three beings then levitated her outside her 12th story apartment window, floating in a blue-white light up into a clamshell-shaped spaceship. Okay, wait, hang on a sec, though. 
Let's pause. She thought they were telling her to be quiet. Mm -hmm. Was she scared? Is this why she just went with it? I'm gonna assume that there must be some kind of calming influence to them. Okay. Like, I don't think they would just go into, like, you don't break into someone's house and go, shh. <laughs> right, without that person going, what the fuck? <laughs> I know. Especially if you look like a ninja. Once inside, the beings experimented on her, including putting an instrument inside her nose. After, she woke up nearly two hours later at 5 a.m. next to her husband in bed. In 1991, two years after the abduction, Linda reached out to Hopkins with an x-ray of her nose showing a cylindrical object that Hopkins describes as having, quote, spiraling extensions that curl out away from her face, end quote. The x-ray was taken by podiatric surgeon and Linda's niece, Lisa Bayer. Shortly after, Linda claimed the object was removed during the